for the uh, month of November, I've chosen the theme of looking at my understanding of the cross. So in today's readings, I want to connect the cross and transfiguration. So it's a passage from Luke's gospel, and this is exactly what Luke does. And Jesus said to all, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? Now, about eight days after saying these things, he took with him Peter and John and James and went up onto the mountain to pray. And as he was praying, the appearance of his face was altered and his clothing became dazzling white. And behold, two men were talking with him, Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. And a voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. And when the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone. And they kept silent and told nobody in those days anything of what they had seen. Words inspired by God. Over the years, I've spoken many, many, many times about my great-grandmother, whom I called Muddy because I couldn't pronounce her name. And she was a tiny little woman. She was as rotund as she was high. And I spent a lot of time with her during the first six years of my life, particularly. And she lived at number three, Washington Street in Cork City, at the very, very top of a tenement building, the third story. And she would labor her way up the stories, you know, step by step by step to a tiny little garret up at the top. And I spent many a night there with her. And in the morning time, she'd visit three different churches, which were then about a mile of where she lived. And we'd start off in the Franciscan church, uh, but with the, built by the friars. And it was a fairly modern building. I'm talking now about the late 1940s. And it was uh, filled with light. It was a light, light-filled building. It had a great energy there. And then when mass was finished there, we'd walk across to another church, which was about half a mile away, called St. Peter's and Paul's. And it was the parish church. And it was a huge uh, cavernous like building. But there was a kind of a, a womb-like quality to the darkness there. It felt like it was pregnant with possibility. And we'd, we'd attend mass there. And then the third one on our way back home, we go to an Augustinian church. And that was my favorite. Because as you went in the entrance, the kind of into the church was to your left. But right in front of you was the most realistic depiction of the crucifixion I've ever seen in my life. I've never seen, it was a life-size statue sculpted of Jesus, the two Marys, uh, Mother Mary and Mary of Magdala and John the Beloved. And I have never seen, you know, physical pain articulated so brilliantly in a piece of sculpture or the grief of those who are watching it. It made this huge, huge impression. And no matter where I've gone and what I've seen since, I have never met a depiction of the crucifixion that moved me as much as this one. And so for the, the month of November, I've chosen the theme of uh, the, the cross. But what I want to do is I want to dismantle and reassemble the cross of Jesus because I think for the main part, it is radically misunderstood. So I had to take it apart and reconstruct it according to my own, my own insights. And so over the next two Sundays, then I developed that thesis. So today I'll just deal with three aspects. I'll talk about this notion of uh, the daily cross, take up your cross daily that we just met in Luke's gospel. And then I want to look at this, what I would call the single focus errors, which are focused completely on the death of Jesus rather than the life of Jesus. And then thirdly, I want to look at the notion of repentance. So that's what I'll cover today. And then I'll take it on further next week with God's help. So if I were to try to exegete the passage, which I've just read for you from Luke, and to take it line by line, when Jesus says, take up your cross daily and follow me, he's not saying, you know, live in order to get crucified, invite all this kind of turmoil and pain and hardship into your life. That's the last thing he has in mind. 
It's not about expecting life to be really, really tough and kind of ushering it in. Here I am, crucify me. That is not what he means by taking up your cross daily. What he means is that you must learn how to harvest every moment, every relationship for the hidden presence of the divine. So the cross is the recognition that there is divinity in every single incident and every particular relationship. And so the, to, the, it's a two-step process then. The first one is to deny the self, and the second one, follow me, as Christ is saying. So denying yourself is not about self-abasement in any sense of the word. It means the disidentification with the ego, or even worse, the, uh, the identification with the id, that little me, 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 me part of it that wants everything. So denying the self yeah, is actually about disidentifying with that, the role that you're playing, the realization, you know, this is not who you are. This is a role you chose to play in incarnation. Who you are is a soul being who is eternal, who was never born and will never die. And that's what the follow me part of it. Denying the self means you have to disidentify with lesser versions of whom you think yourself to be. You are not this skin encapsulated ego. You are not the relationships of which you are a part. You're not the job you do. You're not the professions. You're not your thoughts. You're not your emotions. You are a soul self who volunteered for incarnation. So the first part of that realization is I have to disidentify with the ego or the role that I'm playing. I have to play that role, but I cannot identify with that role any more than an actor on stage then goes home and continues to pretend to be Hamlet in front of his family. And the follow me then means identify with the soul self, perhaps even at some stage, identify with the source self. Because I keep saying to you that there are at least three levels of the self. There's the kind of the role self, the, the character you've chosen to play in this particular incarnation. Then there is the soul self, this eternal holographic fractal of source of which you are, you were never born and you will never die, that as part of you. And then there's the source self, the fact that ultimately only God exists. We are characters in God's dream. We are how God experiences. So the follow, when Jesus says, follow me, he doesn't mean come after me, the carpenter from Galilee. He does not mean that. He says, identify the way I identify. Identify as a child of God. Identify as a soul. So the follow me is not about you know, even traipsing to church on a Sunday you know, are saying, I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. It is not about that. It is becoming what Jesus became. It is identifying the self as Jesus identified the self within him. And this, the Hinduism will have a great phrase for this. They call it self-realization. Now, realization, you know, has two very different meanings, but they're combined. To realize something means to maybe understand it for the first time. Oh, I just realized that. And so realization is about, you know, understanding something for the first time. But it also means to make real. To realize means to make it real, to bring it into the foreground in some senses. And this is the great notion of Hinduism. Self-realization is the understanding that I am not my ego. I just understood for the first time that I'm not my ego. And I really, I'm making that real in my life. I'm acting from my soul self or from my source self. And Hinduism will conclude then by saying, Namaste, the divine in me recognizes and honors the divine in you. So then Jesus goes on and says, because whoever would save his life will lose it. In other words, if I identify with my ego, you know, at, the, at death, that's it. The ego is gone. So I've lost everything. So it's like I waste a whole lifetime and never access or liberate the soul self. That's what he means by whoever kind of wants to save his life, as long as I identify with the ego, is going to lose it. At the end of the life, there is no ego left. And then you've lost. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it, said Jesus. In other words, whoever learns to transcend the ego in order to access or manifest the soul will fulfill the mission, the very, very purpose for which you and I have come. So he says, what does it profit a person if he gains the whole world and forfeits or loses himself, his very self? Because neither fame nor fortune can compensate for the waste of an entire incarnation lived at the ego level. There is no profit in that. It's the total waste of an incarnation. If I've identified completely with the ego, no matter how successful I appear to be, no matter how rich I am or how, how famous I become, it's a wasted incarnation if I've identified with ego.
So what happens then when we have the courage to somehow, you know, look beyond the ego and begin identifying with the soul self? What does the soul self look like when we've broken through the illusions of the ego world? And it's interesting to me that in Luke's account, he goes right on to the story of the transfiguration. It's as if to say to us, this is what it looks like when you let go of the identification with the small self, the ego self. What happens? Here's what happens. And he's using Jesus as an illustration of what happens. He's not pointing this out as a unique event that only happened in the life of Jesus. What he's saying to us, this is what happens when you disidentify with the small self and you re-identify with the source self or the soul self. So there's this extraordinary account then of Jesus going up into the top of Mount Tabor with Peter and James and John and having this extraordinary experience, so intense that literally his very clothes took on the brightness of the encounter and his face did. And what happens to him? He goes transpersonal. All of a sudden, he's not identified with Jesus anymore. He's not the carpenter from Nazareth anymore. He's not even the rabbi anymore. He's this bite-sized piece of God that chose to incarnate on planet Earth. So he's gone transpersonal. So that's what happens when we have the courage to let go of the ego self and identify with the soul self. We go transpersonal. I'm no longer the person I thought myself to be. And he went trans-temporal. He's having an encounter with Moses, who would have lived 1,250 years before, and Elijah, who lived 850 years before. So in that space, there is no time. We've gone trans-temporal. Everything is in the, the, the ever-present now. Moreover, he goes trans-tribal. Because when you look at it, you read through the scriptures, both Moses and Elijah were mass murderers. And Moses was a serial killer. And they did it in the name of religion. Jesus is advocating forgiveness and even love of the enemy. And therefore, he fulfilled the mystical impulse that underlies Judaism, and which is the mission of all true spirituality. And so that is what happens when we manage somehow to disidentify with the ego and re-identify with the soul self. We're out of time, we're trans-temporal, we're transpersonal, we're trans-tribal, and now we're identifying with the essence of God in everything. So that's how I would impact those, those statements of Jesus. My second point then I might call uh, the single focus errors. The church in its great wisdom has managed to focus almost exclusively on the suffering and death of Jesus rather than his life and of his teaching. And to add insult to injury, they emphasize this notion of redemption. Redemption you know, etymologically means to buy back. Uh, like the phrase you remember from your Latin, uh, caveat emptor, buyer beware. So redemption means literally buying back. So there's this crazy notion in Christian theology that somehow God and Satan made a covenant and that God needed, you can have a, needs to be repaid for the insult of the sin of Adam and Eve. And uh, with the sin of Adam and Eve, somehow Satan got control of us. And Satan will only let go of us if God agrees to, sac to, agrees to sacrifice his only begotten son, Jesus. Talk about Mishavas, total craziness that God and Satan are in this bargaining situation where the only way that God's anger against humanity can be satisfied, you know, and that let us back in is if he sacrifices his own son. And so Satan gets the victory. Now, the death of Jesus is important but it was not the purpose of his incarnation. Jesus did not come in order to die cruelly on the cross. He came because of who he was and what he said, what he taught and how he, how he, how he behaved. And his death was, it was almost inevitable in the sense that he was a person of his time preaching the mission he preached. He was such a, a kind of a, a danger to the Roman authorities and to kind of legalism of his spirituality that it was almost inevitable that he could wind up being executed and the method of execution was crucifixion. So it was almost inevitable, you know, that he would wind up crucified. But this was not the object of the exercise. Even, you know, to the very end, Christ remained true to his teaching and to his mission, whether it was even in Gethsemane or in Golgotha, he remained completely true to the mission. In fact, I would hold that if Jesus had lived to be 80 years of age and was dandling his grandkids on his knee, his life would have been no less effective than it was. 
He did not come to die in order to rescue us because God made a contact with Satan demanding a crucifixion. That, it was inevitable given who he was and when he lived, but that was not the purpose of his coming. So this focus on Jesus as a sacrificial lamb rather than on a man for all seasons you know, has been this single focus of the churches. So that's one side of it. There are people who focus almost completely on the suffering element and suffering is a part of life. Every single one of us will, will experience it. And on the other hand, you've got what I might call kind of Peter Pan pain-free new age Christians who refuse to consider any kind of suffering or any kind of death. It's all kumbaya without the cross. So we got these two parts of it. You know, it's either it has to be pain-free and loving and everything goes my way, or it's all about death and suffering and the cross. Somewhere in between is the truth. It's the ability to live life every single day in love. So I would say then that the last 24 hours of Jesus' life was a demonstration on how to die. The last 24 hours was a demonstration of how to die. And I will expand that much further, expand that much further next Sunday, God willing. But the previous 30 years of his life was a demonstration of how to live. And his entire incarnation was a demonstration of how to love. So he demonstrates all facets of it. The last 24 hours of his life demonstrated how to die a great, beautiful, holy death. And the previous 30 years, how to live a loving life. And the entire incarnation, how to love during life. So I want to try to back away from that single focus that it's all about suffering and all about death, or you can avoid it completely with some kind of new age mumbo jumbo, and you never have to suffer. You can attract you all the goodies and none of the bad things. It's my second point. I want to pick up then on this notion of repentance that comes in this passage as well from Luke's gospel. And you find it particularly in Mark's gospel, where he says, repent and believe in the good news. So let me unpack that a little bit firstly. Christ is coming to preach good news. Mostly what we hear in the churches is not good. It's the same old hat repeated again and again and again and again. A priest who learned it from 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 a priest. So it's all hat and there's nothing good about it. It's about inspiring fear and terror now and in the afterlife. So what is the good news that Jesus is preaching? It has to be good. It has to be new. What's new about it is that it's not about legalism or law. It's about love and compassion and forgiveness. You know? And what's new about it is it's the, maybe the first time in, in humanity. You know, you've got previous efforts like maybe the Buddha 550 years before who emphasized compassion. So you get these outposts occasionally of good news that are quashed very, very, very quickly. So he says, believe in the good news. So the belief system has to kind of teach us how to dispense with fear you know, in the now and terror about the future. So what does repentance then actually mean? The Greek word that's used in the, in the New Testament is the word metanoia. And uh, it's typically translated as a change of mind. Metanoia or repentance means a change of mind. I want to unpack it a little bit differently because uh, it's based on two Greek words. Meta means beyond or above or separate from. You know, and uh, noia comes from the Greek word nous, which means the mind. So you could say, yeah, it is a change of mind. But I have a different translation. Meta means above or beyond. And nous means mind. So I think it is going beyond mind. It's not just a change of mind. You're not using your mind to make the difference. You're going beyond the mind. And where you go beyond the mind, you're going transrational. So what does transrational mean? It means, you know, not abandoning reason, but going away beyond it. And going to places that reason cannot take you. And that is depending somehow on some great intuitive faculties, depending on a soul sense of the self. And that's why when people beat their breasts, it's not about saying, I'm a schmuck, I'm a schmuck, I'm a schmuck, I'm a sinner, I'm a sinner, I'm a sinner. It is not about that. When you beat your breasts, it's like you're in, in, a, in an ER room and they're putting paddles on you. Your heart has stopped beating and they put paddles on you to kind of waken up the heart again. That's what beating the breast should be about. It's not saying I'm a sinner, I'm a sinner, I'm unworthy. And I'm trying to reactivate my, my heart center, trying to reactivate my soul sense. So it's an invitation to go from a mindset, just reason, to a soul sense, to go from an ego to a soul. And that's why Jesus will insist on preaching in parables and stories and metaphors and allegories. 
because he says very famously in Matthew's gospel in chapter 13, you know, uh, I speak in parables so that seeing you may see, but not understand. Hearing you may hear, but not comprehend. Why have we deal with that? Because as long as the audience is trying to unpack his teaching at an intellectual level, they're not going to get it. So he's trying to appeal to the heart sense or to the soul sense of the self. And for that reason, he chooses to speak in parables. And so the cross, I believe, properly understood, is how we find the thin places, what we call in Gaelic, thin places, and how we learn to pierce the veil of Maya and see beyond. That is the true function of the cross. The cross is a veil piercing mechanism that allows us to see with the eyes of the soul and with the understanding of the heart. Namaste, brothers and sisters.